than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and So now, uh, if you remember how your instructor Andrew Crowdy looked like, unfortunately I'm not Andrew Crowdy. Uh, my name is uh, Lin Ma. I'm a postdoc at CMU uh, Database Group. So I'm pretty sure that at this point you all start to uh, missing Andrew already, uh, but uh, I will be the instructor that covers the lectures for the rest of you guys, uh, for the rest of this semester for you guys. So why it's me? It's not me. Okay. Well, that's because I've been uh, learning about databases uh, for many years. So I was a uh, PhD student at this very university, CMU, uh, working with, with Andy to learn about databases. So uh, that's when I started uh, my PhD journey in Andy's office to learn databases. So that was me when I was learning uh, more about databases. And then I was learning a lot more about databases, I'm still in Andy's office. And finally, I just learned uh, too much about databases. <laughs> so here I am today, uh, talking about databases to you guys. All right. So first of all, a little bit of administrative stuff. Uh, so the midterms are all uh, graded. So I believe we, are, we have already uh, posted all of your midterm grades on Canvas so far. So I'm not sure whether it's synced correctly uh, with S3 yet, because we are having some uh, syncing issues. But uh, I mean, we, are, we already post all of them on Canvas. I think you should be able to check it out. And if you have um, any questions about your exams, like any concerns about your grades, etc., uh, you could come to uh, either me or Andrew's office hour. So we'll have all the exam papers uh, stacked there, and you could check it out if you have uh, questions or concerns. And also, uh, I was traveling before, so I, my office hour was on Zoom. But now, since I obviously I came back, I will change my office hour to uh, tomorrow, uh, two thirty to uh, four. And in, it's, uh, it's the same place as Andrew's office, office hour. Essentially, it's in uh, Andy Pavlo's office. And again, uh, like we have announced on uh, Piazza, we have postponed the uh, due date of Project Two to uh, the twenty-first. So uh, this is because of various uh, policy changes, right? I have mentioned on um, Piazza. And then because of that, we have also postponed the release date of Project 3 uh, to October the 20th, right? That will be on Wednesday, right? Sounds good? Okay, now let's get to uh, today's lecture. So today we're going to talk about uh, query planning and query optimization. So if you remember, we talked about earlier in the semester, CQ is really a declarative language. What does it mean? That means that Hey, if you want to uh, query the database about some uh, questions, you just tell a database at a high level what you want to retrieve, right? You want to retrieve the results of um, some columns, like based on some predicates, like given, at, at a given specified amount of year, etc. But then you didn't tell the database how to execute it or how to execute it uh, efficiently. And then we have covered lots of uh, different organizations in databases, right? We have talked about different drawing algorithms, et cetera. And you can probably tell that different options, right? Different implementations or different ways to execute a query may actually end up with a very different performance in terms of the queries. So it's actually very, very important for the database to pick a best way to execute a query uh, and execute it, execute it efficiently to give you uh, the correct answer in time. So uh, this is actually a very, very important for the database system. And as far as I'm concerned, it's actually a still an a unsolved problem. Right? There are still lots of uh, efforts put in this area, and either enterprise or uh, open source database, they still uh, put lots of efforts uh, in this. So talk a little bit about history. So like many other concepts in database, this uh, concept of query optimization also dates back to the, to the 70s, the very early stage of the database system. So when uh, this, like, the author or the inventor of relational algebra, Ted Codd, uh, wrote the paper about I mean, relational algebra, they actually, he actually didn't specify uh, how to implement all these things. And then later on, in 1970s, it's a research group uh, from IBM uh, that have a bunch of PhDs from uh, mathematics or computer science. They saw this paper and they decided that, hey, this is actually a good idea. Let's implement a system based on that. And I don't know whether uh, Andrew covered this uh, story earlier in the, in the class, but essentially um, these researchers at I IBM, each of them would pick a specific part of the database system. I mean, one guy picked the language, which is CQ. The other guy uh, or a lady picked uh, the checkpointing or logging algorithm. There's some other people pick the two-phase logging. And then there's a, uh, a very uh, a renounced uh, 
a researcher called Pat Salinger, uh, she actually picked uh, query optimization. And essentially, uh, many of the uh, concepts and methods about uh, the query optimization we are going to discuss today uh, actually are already being discussed or at least explored uh, in the original system R uh, in, the, in the 1970s. And then one interesting thing at that time is that back in the days, people are actually very skeptical about the idea of a query optimizer, right? Essentially, they're arguing that uh, a machine or a computer program can never come up with a way to execute a query better than how human can specify exactly uh, how the system should execute that query. So what does this look similar to, right? It's similar to the idea of um, the compiler for high-level language, right? So when the first time uh, the language C is, is uh, I mean, invented, then many people would argue that, hey, why do you want a high-level language like C, right? Nobody can write a, um, a, a new computer can really generate assemblies that is more efficient uh, than a human expert can handwritten. But then over the years, people found, found out that, hey, it's actually a good idea to have a high-level language even though it may not have uh, the most efficient assembly code that you can execute. But then, since it's high level, right, lots of features, lots of functionalities the language can provide, then people can actually use the high level language to do um, more interesting things, right? Right now, there are even uh, more high level language like Python or Scala. So, but at that time, it's, it's considered a, a radical idea. And then there's no textbook, te textbook on a query optimizer. So uh, lots of the concepts uh, and the methods were just uh, developed by uh, the researchers there and then improved over time by uh, people like us. Uh, by the way, that system is called uh, System R. And then uh, uh, lastly, I want to mention that uh, there are actually uh, many assumptions that they made uh, in System R at that time actually are still carried over today, right? Because again, like I mentioned, query organization is a, a pretty difficult and pretty important problem, and people come up, with, come up with methods to simplify things, right? To make assumptions, to make the problem tractable. And then many of these assumptions, actually, we are still using them today. And uh, essentially, that means that uh, we may not be able to find the optimal way to execute query because of lots of the simpl simplification and assumptions we made. But then it's a good enough uh, approxi approximation in most of the cases, all right? So next, for query optimization, right, how to solve it exactly? In general, there are two uh, types of methods that we are going to discuss uh, in this class, as well as uh, generally there are two types of methods used in systems, in, used in systems today as well. The first will be called heuristics or rules which means that essentially you just write, uh, I mean, simple uh, methods, or oh, sorry, simple policies, right, using either uh, if or else clauses, or you have some uh, more complex rule engine that will help you do that, but essentially you can write specific uh, clauses and heuristics to enumerate the query plan, and then you can do so without actually uh, looking at the data, right, just at the query, uh, SQL query level, as well as uh, you can go a little bit deeper to try to parse it, right, to try to uh, take a look at the syntax tree of the SQL query. But essentially, without looking at the data, you can use some heuristics and uh, simple rules to uh, approximate what would be a preferred uh, way to execute that query. Right. Uh, but this could be uh, simple things like um, how do you uh, rearrange the predic predicates a little bit, or there was some uh, pre-processing of the obvious uh, uh, optimization you can do in the predicates as well. But of course, there are more complex things that you just cannot solve with simple heuristics, right? That's what we are going to solve with the second type of approach called cost-based approach. Essentially, there are complex things like um, how do you decide uh, for example, if there are, there's a three-way drawing, how do you decide which two table you're going to draw for, drawing first, and which two, two table you're going to join next? And uh, when there are choices like whether you should use um, a sort uh, merge join or nested loop join or hash join, right? Those uh, questions are probably more difficult to, and probably very difficult to answer with uh, simple heuristics or like uh, simple rules. So in that case, we will have a cost-based search to use a cost model and then a enumeration mechanism to explore different uh, complicated alternatives of the query plan, if you will, and then uh, figure out the optimal choices among those uh, more complex alternatives. And uh, usually, a uh, mature system will have uh, both of these mechanisms in place, but then there will be some uh, newer databases that's still in the early, day, early stage of the development, for example, then they may uh, only have the first type because obviously that's easier, 
So <laughs> now to uh, give you an overview of uh, how this query optimization process would take, uh, would take place. So I would warn that uh, at this point, you probably feel like this is going to be a little bit abstract because it's the overview, right? Because, uh, and, and uh, I will try my best to give you some examples and walk you uh, through the process. But then again, it's a little bit complex problem. There are quite a few uh, steps. Uh, so uh, it might be a little bit abstract, but then as we uh, go further into the lecture, it will become more clear. So now, which is a high-level overview. Let's say uh, you, read a, you wrote a SQL query, right, just like uh, what you have done in the uh, first assignment, and then the SQL query, when the SQL query first arrives at the database system, you actually immediately have an option to look at just the raw string of the SQL query, right, to maybe uh, tweak things a little bit and rearrange uh, the positions of uh, different tokens and uh, different specifications, etc. But of course, it's very difficult at this stage uh, to rewrite uh, the SQL query to be a very efficient form, right? Because if you just look at the raw SQL stream, I mean, there's not that much information there, right? But I mean, there are papers saying that you 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 can you could do it, but in practice, um, people rarely uh, actually start to uh, op optimize uh, the query at this early stage. So what would uh, people typically do? Well, people could, would would uh, typically uh, just uh, parse. Uh, this SQL query to a abstract syntax tree, essentially. So that's it's just a straightforward uh, compilation technique you learn from your compiler class, right? You look at the tokens, right? What will be the keywords, and what will be the um, tokens for the uh, tables and the columns, etc. Right? You generate the uh, syntax of this query, syntax tree. And then what do you do? You actually uh, bind this uh, syntax tree with the information in the database system. So uh, typically, uh, there will be a component in a database system called system catalog. Essentially, that's just the metadata about the system, right? It stores so what's the name of each table, what's the name of each column, and the column ID, a table ID, et cetera. Right? It would uh, just, uh, this uh, next binder step would just uh, bind the tokens, especially the names of the tables columns in this abstract syntax tree uh, to the information in the system catalog or metadata, right? So that at this point, you already know the semantics of the query, right? At a high level, you already know what this query is trying to do. Uh, and by the way, either the parser will, or the binder would have like too complex organization or any organization at this point, right? This is just a straightforward uh, compiler technique to look at the query and then try to understand the syntax of the query. So now, the result of this uh, binder step would, would be uh, what we call the logical plan of the query, right? So that's where we're going, we are going to start the optimization. So one important thing I, I need to emphasize here is that for one specific SQL query, there could be a multiple possible valid logical plan for that query, right? So this is just, the logical plan is just trying to figure out, hey, at a high level, what this uh, SQL query is trying to do. And then uh, usually at this step, it just uh, generates a, uh, the, a logical plan that is most, the most convenient to generate at this point, even though there are multiple alternatives. Which means that if uh, there's a multi-way join, for example, A join B join C, and if you specify the join order to be A join B join C, then in this logical plan at this point, you are likely to get a, a logical plan that just uh, follows that order, right? It will not reorder things, it will not try to optimize the predicates, etc. But just be reminded, mindful that there could be multiple equivalent logical plans. But at this point, before the optimization, we just generate a single logical plan that is valid, right? That's it. <laughs> then the next step would just be the uh, tree rewriter, or you can call it logical rewriter, right? Similar thing. So uh, this is actually uh, pretty common in databases. And uh, I think it's fair to say that most databases will have this step to rewrite uh, the logical query plan. So what it needs to do, essentially it needs to look at, again, the information in the system catalog, look at what will be the uh, queries, uh, sorry, what will be the columns and the tables, and start to apply a simple heuristics that I mentioned earlier uh, to prune down obvious uh, stupid uh, execution choices. Right? And we'll give more examples later on, but just thing to remind here is that at this point, it's purely look at the structure of the logical uh, query plan as well as the metadata information in the catalog, right? We are not looking at the data at all, right? No information, uh, no, how many rows, right? What would be the 
uh, properties or data distribution of different rows know any of those information yet. Right? This is like simple logical heuristics. And then after the logical rewrite, this uh, optimized logical plan will be sent to the query optimizer. Or in this case, uh, we use the, I mean, the name query optimizer to specifically represent the uh, cost-based uh, plan enumeration, which will be uh, the most complicated step, if you will, to generate uh, advanced optimization and with the information both uh, in the uh, system catalog, the metadata, as well as we'll have a cost model and a statistic look at the data in the system itself. What will be the distribution of different columns, right? How many rows in, in each column? And then what will be the number of distinct values, et cetera? Uh, and we are going to, like I mentioned earlier, we are going to figure out, uh, we are going to make decisions on complex optimization choices. And lastly, this uh, physical plan, which is to send back to the uh, system to execute. All right, any question on this overview so far? Okay. So uh, just uh, uh, a little bit more note to uh, distinguish a logical plan and a physical plan. So uh, essentially uh, the job of the uh, query optimizer is to uh, generate a uh, well, physical uh, relational algebra representation that the system can execute in the most efficient manner, right? And then we have this distinction between logical and physical because at the physical level, there are many choices, right, that the system can explore that the search space is just so huge, right? Uh, for example, different orders of drawing, a right? pretty complex uh, decision, many different choices, and different methods for your drawing, either sort merge drawing, hash drawing, as a loop drawing, et cetera, lots of different choices. So if you are trying to enumerate all those uh, like alternatives or physical plans, then the search space would be too big, right? So to solve this, we have this distinction between logical and physical. So before we even get to those uh, complex optimization choices, if by just looking at this um, at a high level, what this query is trying to do, right? What would be the uh, uh, what would be the operations at a high level? Just just look at the predicates and the uh, drawing structures. If there are simple rules that we can already apply to uh, eliminate the obvious stupid choices, right? To shrink down the search space as much as possible, then that will help the uh, later on physical en enumeration to be uh, much more targeted and much more efficient. Right? Uh, another note on this would be that um, usually there would be a one-to-one uh, -one mapping from logical operators to physical operators in the plan. For example, in a logical plan, uh, maybe it will just specify at a high level, table A is going to join table B, right? That's it, that would be, would be the things uh, that would uh, show up in the logical plan. But then the physical plan, it will say that, hey, table A is going to join table B uh, using a hash join. Right, under what a property. And maybe either you could compress data or not, not compress data, et cetera, right? Uh, but, but usually it's just a one-to-one -one mapping. It's just the physical plan would be much more specific, uh, contains like a specific algorithm and choices you want to do. But there will be uh, some uh, exceptional cases, if you will, uh, that uh, multiple logical operator may map to a, a single physical operator in the plan. Uh, for example, if you have a logical uh, join operator, I join table B, but then order by uh, some lo a logical order by uh, operator to order by some column, but then if you choose to use a sort merge join in your physical operator, then you can perform the join and the order by the two steps in a single uh, physical sort of merge join, right? So in that case, even though there, there could be two logical operators, you may end up with only one uh, single physical operator. Make sense? All right. So uh, more comments on the uh, overall query optimization problem. It's, it's, it's just, it's an NP-hard problem, right? It's, it's, I think it's arguably the uh, most difficult problem uh, in database uh, systems that you have to solve. And uh, again, uh, based on my understanding, it's still a uh, unsolved problem uh, today. And then uh, many people, including uh, commercial database uh, vendors as well as open source communities are still uh, taking lots of efforts in this space. And just to give you an example, uh, based on the information, I know the uh, query optimizer in a SQL Server, right, which is the, the flagship data, data product, database product from Microsoft, that's the optimizer itself contains uh, more than a million lines of code. Uh, so it's, it's pretty complex and uh, uh, lots of, uh, well, lots of efforts there, but also lots of opportunities there as well, I should say. And then another thing is that, I mean, a, a, a question that many people 
uh, would ask these days is that, hey, uh, since this problem is, is pretty difficult, then have people considered using the new uh, machine learning or like neural network, artificial intelligence, whatever, to help this problem? Well, the answer is, uh, is obviously yes, right? There are lots of um, uh, recent research uh, talking about this. Uh, uh, I mean, there are many uh, interesting topics uh, or interesting discussions, but based on what I know, right, uh, there are uh, the application of uh, machine learning techniques to help out in this space is still uh, very, uh, very limited, if you will. Uh, so people are still uh, exploring uh, this option. I mean, doing lots of experiments at, at, at experimental stage at this point, and it's it's in the very near future. It's probably uh, the the machine learning based approach is not going to probably not going to replace the uh, high level structure of the query of that either. Even though there could be uh, specific cases like specific. Uh, sub problems in the query optimization that machine learning can help, but the overall structure that we're going to talk about about the query optimizer in this course will probably uh, just to rem be remain as it is uh, for the foreseeable future. And as an example, uh, uh, IBM DB2 had an earlier project called Leo that it would help a specific sub problem in query optimization called uh, carnality estimation uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, but then after a few years, they actually uh, abandoned uh, that project. Right, because essentially, um, when the machine learning things or the machine learning model work, uh, that's great, right? But then the problem is that uh, if it doesn't work, then uh, why doesn't it work, right? It's going to cause lots of trouble for the people to figure out, hey, what's going on when your uh, model doesn't work, and then how to fix it. Uh, but that said, uh, based on the uh, information I know, I think a year or two ago, they actually revived, I mean, IBM actually revived that project, and they started to look at it again. Right, so this is actually still a uh, ongoing effort, and then at some point, I mean, this uh, could be uh, a part of the optimizer that uh, can make it more efficient. Okay. So now uh, today's agenda. Uh, most of the uh, today's lecture will be focusing on the first type of optimization that I talked about earlier, which is the um, heuristics or the rules uh, that you can directly uh, apply at the logical operator level. Right. Could include, uh, we will talk a little bit about the equivalence in the relational algebra so that we can explore different alternatives. And we talk about, of course, logical query optimization as, as how do we uh, expand uh, nested queries, and then how do we do some uh, simple optimization on the predicates. I mean, by expression here it just means mostly the expression in the predicates. And uh, I, I think we still would have a little bit of time after that. So after that, I will be give a little bit of heads up on the cost model approach. Uh, uh, which is the second approach, or second type of approach for query optimization. Uh, but then we will focus on that more on the next lecture. Okay. So an important concept before we talk about any optimization is uh, relational algebra equivalence. Because if you want to optimize the query, you have to guarantee that no matter how you optimize, the query is still correct, right? But otherwise, like, uh, you, you, what's the point of optimization if you, if you generate the wrong query? So the definition of correct would just be uh, the equivalence uh, of relational based on this relational algebra property. So more specifically, uh, two relational algebra expressions are considered equivalent if they, if they generate the same set of tuples at the end of the day and also uh, in the same order. It's not written in the size, but also needs to be in the same order. And then uh, the DB, DB database system will just uh, try to uh, figure out the uh, better alternatives out of all those uh, uh, relation, equivalent relational algebras, algebra expressions uh, to uh, execute that query. Right? That's essentially the job of query optimization, or we can call, also call it query writing. So uh, the first example, and it's probably the most common example we will be using, uh, is uh, called predicate pushdown. I think. I mean, I, I think this is actually probably uh, more implemented in, uh, in every uh, mature database system out there. So uh, what we can do, so how to, to exemplify this, say we have this uh, simple query where we are uh, just uh, joining uh, two tables, and then student and enrolled, and then we do a filter right, on the uh, grade of the students, and then we uh, project the name and the ID out. So if you just execute it uh, this way, then we can, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, 
Uh, we can draw the uh, relational algebra expression, which is the, essentially uh, looks very similar or essentially the same as the uh, logical query plan of this query, right? That would be essentially be the relational algebra expression. So as you can see here, uh, we have a uh, drawing on the student and an enrolled, and then after that, uh, we can filter on this uh, grade, and then uh, we uh, project the name and ID. So like, again, like I mentioned before, this the, the this logical query plan we are seeing here is what would show up immediately after the binder step, right? So after the binder step, even though there could be a multiple valid alternatives for the uh, logical query plan, we are only going to pick one logical query plan that is uh, convenient, right? And then we are going to start our optimization uh, from there. So if you look at this uh, logical query plan, right, or relational algebra expression, same thing, what do we can do here to optimize it? Well, then one obvious thing we could optimize is that we can actually uh, push this predicate, which is going to filter uh, the grades based on the uh, grade level A, before we execute the join, right? So essentially, right after we uh, uh, access the uh, enrolled table and read all the data, we can already apply uh, this filter to only select the columns that has this uh, grade equals to A before we perform the join. Then, when we perform the join, uh, we will we'll only be looking at mu a much smaller number of uh, columns in this case, right? And then the join uh, would be, because the, the join is a, uh, well, in the worst case, the join could be a Cartesian product, right? But in this case, uh, after we filter out the grade uh, based on A, I mean, the number of tuples that we need to uh, feed into the join operation would be uh, much less, right? So the join can be uh, much more efficient in this case. And again, to uh, uh, reiterate the concept of relational algebra equivalence, the two uh, approaches, or sorry, two uh, expressions that we considered just now, the one is the first do the join, and then do the filter, and then do the projection, as well as you do the projection earlier, and then after that, you do the join, and then, sorry, com 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 uh, comparing to the second uh, e equation where you do the filter first uh, on enrolled, and then you do the join, do the projection. I mean, the two expressions will generate the same set of tuples, right? And with the same order. So these are uh, equivalent relational algebra. So uh, more on this uh, predicate pushdown. So uh, the, the example we just showed, we, we just shown uh, just now, was actually pretty simple, right? There's only a one, uh, one filter in the predicates. But what if there are multiple filters, right? I mean, the, 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 the predicate can very well be, hey, you have a grid on A, but then uh, the uh, enrollment date of the students could be something, something, or you are targeting, or maybe you are targeting a students from a specific department, right? So when you are, uh, when you, when the system receives a query, the, the predicate of the query can contain a multiple filters in the predicate. Uh, so what we will do in this case is that it's just that for a set of uh, predicates, I mean, combined with a conjunction, we are just going to uh, break it down, right, to individual predicates, and then we are going to push individual predicates uh, down to the, uh, to the table, to, to, to the uh, position that is closest uh, to where you access that table, right? So you have a predicate on a table in road, right? Back to the example, say you have a predicate on table in road, grade, grade equals to A, then you are going to push this uh, predicate uh, down to this table. Maybe this is better, right? But then if you have another predicate, say it's on student, uh, and you are trying to filter uh, the student by certain department, you're just going to break those two uh, predicates separately and then push the uh, predicate on the student uh, table to the left and then uh, push the uh, predicate on the, on the, on the grade uh, column uh, to the right, right, from the enrolled table. So when you access those table, you already filter out at most tuples uh, as possible. So lastly, uh, there could be also some uh, simplifications you can do uh, by just looking at uh, these uh, predicates, right? Say uh, you, this example here, if you have a where clause that has a predicate, that has a set of predicates called x equals y, and then y equals to three, then you can already uh, use uh, uh, this like uh, so in linear algebra rules to original algebra rules to uh, rewrite uh, this predicate to be uh, x equals to three and y equals to three. Right. So this may seem a little bit naive, right? Like, because essentially uh, there's not that much difference. But this could be actually be very useful, right? For example, these uh, two columns 
x and y, they could actually come from different tables, right? So if you wrote the, if you have the predicates in the first way, x equals y, and then y equals to three, then you can only push down one predicate, right? Because if, if the other predicate x, x equals to y, if that's on the other table, then there's no, no way you can do an early filtering with x equals to y, right? But on the other hand, if you rewrote this to be x equals three, y equals three, then if, again, if x, y are come from different tables, like I mentioned earlier, you can push x to the uh, excess of one table and push the predicate on y to the excess on the other table, and then you can filter out uh, many tuples early. And then uh, with, uh, with this uh, logical uh, regional algebra equivalence, you can also do a more complex things, right? Like uh, rewrite the join orders using the rules like uh, communicativity and associativity, right? Here are some examples here. Uh, but at, at high level, uh, with those uh, rules, you can actually start to generate lots of lots of uh, different uh, alternatives. Uh, for example, with the, these um, join enumeration rules, like all I mean, commutativity and associativity rules specifically, uh, the number of possible join orderings uh, you can generate for an n-way join is uh, approximately a uh, Catalan number, right? Essentially, uh, to four to the, is to the power of uh, the uh, the number of ways you have. And uh, well, then at this stage, you can't really just use uh, the simple heuristics um, or the simple rules to uh, find the better alternatives. So essentially, for a more complex relational algebra equivalences like this, uh, we are not going to consider that uh, in the first type of organization using uh, rules or heuristics. That's what we're going to discuss in the second type of organization with the cost model and a more uh, principled search mechanism. And uh, lastly, right, you can also do um, early projections with the original algebra equivalences. Uh, this would, again, this would, could be something that you could, uh, be, could be done in the uh, logical rewriting phase, where you don't really need uh, the cost model yet. So uh, I would say um, this is mostly uh, useful for the, uh, for the uh, row stores instead of uh, comparing to column stores. Essentially what this does is that if you have a final projection, right, like the example earlier, we are only looking at the uh, ID and the name of uh, some, uh, of some, uh, of, some uh, the, of the records in some table, then we don't have to select everything, right? We can, when we are trying to access the data, we can already only looking at uh, the, the, the records or the columns of the, the eventual projection that we need instead of uh, reading everything out. Again, so this is uh, more often for row stores compared to column stores because for the column stores, uh, you would do later, the columns are separated anyway, right? You only uh, record the ID of the, each row you are going to get and then you do later materialization. So again, give you a specific example here, right? Here, uh, we have uh, this, uh, the same query with uh, the, uh, the, 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 the join on student and enrolled. And finally, we, are just only, we only care about the name of the students as well as this ID, right? So what we can do is that instead of selecting everything, right, every column from student or enrolled, we can just uh, do this projection earlier, right? We can only look at the ID and the name from the student table, and then only look at the, um, these like, two different IDs from the enrolled table that we care about. So, uh, I mean, again, this may seem very uh, simple, but consider a case that your student table could be very large, right? The student table may contain a thousand columns of various students of, 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 with the various information of that student. Then in that case, instead of reading the thousand columns of every tuple, then you could only read uh, these uh, two tuples, uh, sorry, two columns, and then that could significantly uh, save your time for execution. All right, so uh, just to uh, recap a little bit uh, about uh, what we uh, talk about. Uh, so we, 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 we uh, well, we talk about uh, different ways that we can rewrite uh, these queries uh, based on the logical query plan. And then we, uh, an important thing we are going to, we did here is that based on, with these simple rules, we reduce the search space that the later uh, physical query plan enumeration will need to, uh, will need to uh, uh, search over, right? So these are all like a simple heuristics, like very efficient to be done, and then we already reduce our search space uh, significantly. And at this point, we have not looked at uh, the cost model at all, right? We have not looked at uh, either the data distribution or a column distribution at all, right? 
But of course, uh, that also there's another uh, thing I want to mention here is that because we use these heuristics and then uh, these uh, simple rules to change our logical uh, query, uh, query plan, then we are actually not guaranteed that we are always going to generate a, a better plan, an optimal plan, right? Even though based on our intuition, right, based on our understanding of these rules of how the database system works, most of the time right, we, are, we are going to generate a better query plan. But then there could be cases that, hey, if you uh, push down a predicate or if you uh, rewrite a specific question, ex expression, there could be cases that they may be a little bit worse, right? But then that's just a price we are going to pay. Okay, so uh, before I talk about a, uh, talk some uh, more complicated uh, organizations that we could do, is there any uh, questions so far on the uh, query rewrite we talk about? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, yeah, like I mentioned, the wording on the slides is probably not very like a specific. It's actually a, a order list, should be order list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not very, very, very specific, it should be, should be fixed. Anything else? All right, then we can continue. Okay, let's just uh, some uh, more uh, advanced, or oh, not advanced, right, but uh, more involved organizations that we can do still at this uh, uh, logical uh, query rewrite phase, okay? So uh, like I mentioned earlier, right, if you, uh, if a query that have a predicate uh, uh, that contains a multiple uh, filters, then one thing we could do is that we will uh, actually uh, decompose the uh, multiple filters into the predicate in this predicate so that we can we have uh, more opportunities for optimization. So here I'll just give you an example, right? Uh, we're actually using a one of the earlier example in this case. So this is actually a three-way join, right? A join um, artist appears an album, and then I mean, we just have a, a complicated uh, predicate. I mean that contains many clauses and including uh, this like. Uh, uh, a, a specific uh, filter on name, right? Have a specific string that it needs to filter. And, and as you can tell here, uh, if we just have a naive uh, uh, logical query plan generated after binder at this point, then this predicate is pretty big, it's difficult to optimize more, right? So what do we do? We're just going to split uh, this uh, predicate uh, to uh, separate filters, right? And then these are the three filters, filters this predicate has. And then after that, we are just going to look at each filter individually, and then we are just going to try to move these filters to the lowest point possible uh, in this uh, query plan, right? Why we want to do that? Well, because the lower these predicate are, then the earlier that we can filter out unnecessary tuples, right, in this query processing, so that our overall query processing overhead would be lower. So in this case, I mean, we look at these predicates, and then we just uh, push down uh, these uh, predicates um, to uh, corresponding places, right? For example, uh, in, on this uh, predicate that, that on the uh, rightmost filtering on the um, name of this album, right, we can directly apply that filter once we access the data on the album, right? And then, of course, also on the artist and the uh, appears, uh, and, the, and the join there, we, instead of uh, doing a, a Cartesian product, right, just a blindly uh, matching tuples between the artist uh, table as well as the appears table, we, uh, we can push um, this uh, filter to be uh, close uh, to, this, um, to, this, uh, to this join, right? Essentially, there's the artist ID and then uh, this appears ID. And what would this enable us? Well, what this enable us is that not only this filter moves uh, closer to the data access, but also, we can replace a, a naive join operation, right? For example, a Cartesian product, if you don't have um, any uh, filters, with an inner join, once you have a join predicate, right? Because, I mean, you can, that would be uh, much more efficient. So here, essentially, uh, like, like I just said, instead of uh, have a Cartesian product and then filter out uh, the tuples later, we just directly combine the join with the predicates, right? 
that we split up earlier, or filters we split up, split up earlier, so that essentially this can be executed a, as an inner join, which will be uh, much more efficient than a naive Cartesian project. And again, all of these are logical, right? If you just look at the syntax of the query, look at the information, right? What would be the columns and the tables? You can already uh, figure all of these things out, even though you don't know what will be the actual content in the table. Yeah, yeah, essentially uh, that's, that's the same thing. So, okay, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, there will be a, another optimization you can do called early uh, projection, where you, where you just look at uh, the columns, you eventually going to read or return with the, with the results, right? You can look at the specific columns and then push uh, these projections down to the uh, lowest possible point in your query plan. And then you don't need to read all of this, uh, all the columns in the table from the beginning to the end, right? You can just uh, select as few columns as possible at, and as early as possible. Okay, any questions uh, in this example? Cool. Next, uh, another optimization you can do in this uh, logical query write phase is, call, is, is, is to deal with the nested queries, right? So uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, in your, your earlier homework, I think it's homework one, right? Already uh, be uh, familiar with some nested queries that maybe many of you have used of them, some, some of them. So essentially what a database system will do uh, with a nested query by default is that it will just treat nest, uh, the nested query or the inner query as a black box, right, or as a function. And it will just uh, uh, treat it uh, as a function that will take parameters and then return either one value or a set of values. And, but with that, of course, uh, there, it could be a very uh, inefficient way if you just treat it as a black box. So there would be uh, two possible ways that you can uh, accelerate this process. Either uh, you can uh, rewrite uh, this uh, inner query so that you can uh, combine this inner query with the outer query together. So there's no nesting uh, anymore. It all is it, it, it called a flatten sometimes. Or there's other, other choice that you can lift uh, these uh, inner queries outside of this uh, query, uh, or outside the outer query. Essentially, you can execute uh, this uh, inner query in a nested query separately and then store the values first. Right. So later on, you could directly replace the value uh, in the original query instead of uh, executing it as nested query. So let me expand. So uh, for the uh, first approach, uh, the uh, flattening approach, here I'm giving you a, a different example where uh, we are just, uh, it's, it's actually, a, uh, it's, I think it's like an example in a, a Cedars club. You are going to uh, find out the Cedars uh, that have um, any reservation on a specific day, right? Yeah, if you look at the query, it's just uh, a look at uh, all the seeders and then the, the inner query in the where clause is just uh, trying to figure out, hey, whether this seeder has a reservation on a specific day, right? So here we can see that what this inner query has is that it's actually a join query, right? It, it, it is referencing a column uh, in the uh, outer query. So it will just uh, try to pair up the two tables, right, to see whether a sailor, right, in the outer, which would be a record in the outer query, would have a specific uh, corresponding record in the reserve uh, uh, table on that day. So what we can do in this case, right, essentially this looks like a joint query, right? <laughs> So instead of uh, writing this as a subquery, what we can do is that, well, we can just uh, look at these uh, two tables together, right? And then we can have an inner join to join these two tables uh, on this uh, ID and to figure out that whether there will be uh, matching records on that specific day, right? So what would be the benefit of this? The benefit of this is that instead of, I mean, here I mean, the, for, the, for the second approach after the rewrite is one single inner join, right? But then before the rewrite, in the first case, you actually have to re-execute this inner query for each individual query from the outer table, right? Let's say the seeders table has a billion records, right? For example, there could be a billion uh, seeders. Then for each individual seeder, you have to execute the where clause in the, uh, in the inner query once, right? That could be very inefficient uh, if, if the uh, seeder table is uh, pretty large. On the other hand, uh, for the uh, second approach, if you use a inner join, it will be uh, much more efficient. Okay, 
Now that's the case when you want to uh, expand the query and then use a join instead of uh, uh, execute uh, these uh, queries over and over again. <laughs> but then there could be other cases, right? So here I'm giving you an example uh, of a, uh, oh, actually it's just a, a more complex example in the same data set, right? Here we are just trying to figure out uh, the seeders uh, with the highest ratings, and then uh, for, for the seeders that have at least uh, two reservations of red boost, right? So, and then we are going to uh, project the seeder ID as well as the uh, earliest date on which the seeder has a reservation for this boat, right? So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter that much of what uh, this query is exactly trying to do. So what we are going to focus here is that for this inner query, right, it's just trying to uh, figure out the max rating among uh, all the seeders in the table, right? And then uh, the uh, outer query will have a predicate filter specifically based on that. But, but what we can do here is that obviously for this uh, predicate, oh sorry, for this inner query, it's not even referencing any information from the outer query, right? It's not like reading any columns, we're not doing any uh, like predicates, filters, etc. It can be actually executed uh, by itself. So what we can do is that instead of um, for each uh, join operation outside, we execute this um, maximum uh, inner query over and over again, we can actually just uh, pull this inner query out, right? And then execute this inner query ahead of time once and store the result in a temporary table. And then when we ex finally execute the uh, outer query, we can just replace the result, right? So that we don't need to uh, have a duplicate execution of this uh, inner query. So, uh, I mean, here is just a, a, a general rules uh, summarize what I just discussed. For these uh, complex queries, the optimizer would just, uh, again, if it, uh, there's no reference from the inner query to the outer query, then the optimizer can just break it up, right? And then can lift this inner query out to execute it ahead of time and store the result in a temporary table and directly replace it instead of executing it uh, over and over again. Right, so to uh, illustrate what this exactly means, we are going to uh, take a look at this, uh, this, this query block. It's, it's, uh, the standard terminology will be called nested block. And then we leave that up, right, to be a separate query. And then we execute it and then replace the values there, right? And then we just uh, directly execute uh, this second query uh, with these uh, values in place. And the second query, I mean, again, the standard uh, terminology would be called the uh, outer block. All right, any uh, questions so far on the rewriting and nested query expansion, et cetera, uh, we talk about? Uh, yeah. Page 26, okay. Would it be a what after writing? Because the name uh, from the first query it says where is this, but in the second one, um, if a uh, sailor has multiple R dot date, the name might appear many times. Let's see. Uh, second name from sailors. Uh, Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, the problem should be a distinct. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, all right. Okay. Okay. Uh, we talk about nested query. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about a, some simple heuristics or rules you can apply to rewrite expressions, right? So these things would actually be, well, they actually would be, uh, show up a little bit more straightforward uh, than the uh, complex query uh, expansion and flattening, etc. cetera. So uh, what uh, this is doing is that essentially it just look at the predicates, right? So predicates, see the predicate could be um, a, a equals to three or b greater than five, et cetera, et cetera. Then it will just look at the predicate itself 
to see uh, whether using uh, like a simple uh, logical rules, you can just uh, tweak this uh, predicate a little bit to make it uh, simpler or make it to be able to execute it more efficiently, right? So it's not going to uh, touch uh, the other parts of the query. And uh, so for this, there would generally be uh, two different approaches that people implement that. One is that, um, it has time, okay. Man is that uh, many people for this simple uh, rewriting of expressions, they just use if and if then clauses, right? They just write one of rules um, to, uh, to uh, I mean, uh, based on each individual organizations uh, or tweaks they want to apply to the expressions. Or there will be uh, other people that um, have a, developed a more principled way to do this, if you will. They could have a uh, rule uh, or pattern matching engine uh, that uh, they can have a organized way that you can uh, specify uh, each individual uh, 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 rules that you want to tweak these expressions as policies uh, in this engine, right? And, and then the engine would just uh, enumerate uh, these policies or rules and then uh, re-optimize these predicates over and over again until that there's uh, no other, no single rules that is still applicable, right? So that would be a more organized way to approach this. I think CockroachDB uh, did the second way, but many other systems just use one-off if-then clauses. Okay, let's look at a uh, first example here. Again, we have a, a simple table in this case, which is ID as the primary key and then uh, value, not now. Then the first uh, type of organization we can do is just look at the uh, impossible predicates, right? So say uh, we have uh, this, uh, this, this, this table here, sorry, this query here, select star from A where uh, I equals to zero, to zero. Well, there will be uh, no cases that are I equals to zero, right? So essentially, uh, nothing would actually be valid with this query, and then without even executing this query, we already know that, hey, there's no result will come out, right? We don't even need to execute it. <laughs> and then similar, similar, uh, well, not similar, but a little bit related to this, we can also look at the uh, obviously unnecessary predicates. In this case, if there's a predicate uh, called uh, e call one uh, equals to one, then in this case, we, we don't need to evaluate this predicate either, right? We can just simply, because it's always going to be true, we can just uh, simply uh, remove this predicate and then this query, well, even though it, you just remove one predicate, but then you actually just eliminate a step and an operator, right? you limit a filter operator in the query execution. So uh, this query actually became much simpler and then you can just directly read the data and then put that to a uh, output buffer, right? So that would also be an optimization to this query. And then uh, there could be uh, other simple things. Uh, I mean, for this, it, it will be uh, drawing elimination. So in this case, we have a query uh, that is, I mean, I mean drawing uh, two tables that are same, right? Essentially, it uh, selects uh, star from A, well, from A, well, A as A1, and then drawing A as A2. And then uh, it uh, join clause would be the, just be the ID, which is actually be the primary key of that table. So what does it mean? That means that for this uh, drawing query, you would exactly have, uh, I mean, one record would be exactly matching to uh, one record it's, because there's a primary key in that table and just itself, right? So this join is completely uh, unnecessary. And then uh, you can also just limit that and then return everything uh, from the table, right? Because every record will exactly have one match in this query, right? It's just unnecessary to perform the join. Okay, uh, more examples on this. You can actually have a case where uh, you can combine the organization of the uh, joint organization and then subquery, right? So uh, in this case, we it's a little bit similar to the uh, the subquery example we see earlier, right? Where you have a select query and then you try to see whether it, it there exists, and then you, then whether a predicate uh, whether, well, you're trying to have a select query with a predicate uh, with an inner query as a uh, in, in exist clause. And in this case, the inner query um, on the uh, exist uh, uh, operation would actually be the uh, self-join, identity join we talked about earlier, right? So in this case, you can just expand this query, right? You pull um, these queries out, uh, as we talked about earlier, and then if the join was lifted out, you will realize that, hey, this join is completely unnecessary, right? And so after the expansion, you can do the join elimination, and then essentially this query is just the same as uh, selecting everything from A. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> 
Lastly, another uh, rather simple thing you could do here is to uh, merge uh, duplicated or not, not duplicated, but merge predicates together. They actually not duplicated. Right? Let me take, take it back. So uh, in this case, we are selecting star from table A, where the first filter in the predicate would be uh, this value between one and hundred, but then the second filter would be uh, f this value between um, fifty and uh, one hundred fifty, and then just a disjunction here. So uh, in this case, we can actually observe that there's an overlap between the uh, first filter and the second filter. And then since it's a disjunction, we can actually just uh, directly combine these two together. right? Because say if a value is uh, 51, then it satisfies the first filter and then also satisfies the second filter, but we don't really need to evaluate it once. Right? So instead, what we can do is that we just uh, have a wider range that covers 1 to 150. And then for every single tuple, uh, you only need to evaluate it once. All right. Okay, these are all the uh, simple uh, I mean, expression rewrite, or I mean, I, I, I sometimes call them tweaks that you can apply that you could uh, optimize the performance again at a logical rewrite stage. Any other questions? Because before we uh, go a little bit deeper into the, uh, give you a heads up on the uh, cost model based approach that we are going to uh, talk about more focused on next week. Sorry, next class. Is there any questions on logical rewrite so far? Yes, please. In the previous slide. Yes. This slide, you mean? Uh, yeah, this one. Yes. So for the join elimination, this only works uh, because ID is the primary. Yes. And, yeah. and if it wasn't, there could be repeats, so we would. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, but, but since you have the, like I said, in the logical rewrite phase, you can access the information in the metadata, right? So you can know that. But you don't have any information on the data, or the, or the data distribution yet. Okay, uh, just to reiterate this uh, slide a little bit, right? we talk about the uh, simple heuristics or the rules that we can apply to eliminate uh, stupid choices, but then there are more involved organizations that just can, cannot be done with simple rules, right? For example, you have a three-way join, four-way join, you want to figure out hey, whether I should join table A or B first, or B or C first, C or D first, and then you have different choices of joins, for example, have a solid join, high join, etc. I mean, it just with simple heuristics, it's just very difficult to know which one would be the better choice, right? So in this case, we will just uh, use a, a more uh, organized cost-based approach where we are going to have a cost model, right, first, so that we can execute uh, the, uh, the execution cost of a query plan in more detail. And then we need to leverage another uh, search mechanism to help us efficiently uh, explore or enumerate uh, different uh, complicated alternatives of a query plan, and then we cost it. We see that we can try to identify that uh, which, ma which query plan among all the, all the alternatives would be uh, more efficient or have the, uh, a smaller cost. Okay, <laughs> so again, uh, today's class, we are just going to give a little bit of heads up on the cost models we used, and then we will talk a bit more about, uh, about this approach next time. So, uh, well, of course, oh, and obviously, in, uh, in this uh, uh, step or this approach, you need a cost model, right, to estimate the cost of a query plan. Otherwise, you cannot just, uh, you cannot compare different alternatives. And uh, this uh, cost model uh, would just be a way to generate an estimate of the cost of a uh, particular query plan, right, given a specific state of the database system. And uh, I should say that most of the time, or actually not most of the time, uh, essentially almost all the time, this cost of estimation of a query plan is only internal to the database system. That means that if you take a specific database system, right, you take Postgres, and then for Postgres, you have a, a, query or a few different query plans for a query, then you can compare the cost uh, of these different query plans with the Postgres cost model, right? But it doesn't really make sense to say, hey, uh, if you have a query uh, with a query, uh, have a query plan for a query in Postgres with this cost, estimated by Postgres cost model, and then you have a, a different uh, system, for example, MySQ, you have a query plan from MySQ and have a cost estimation. It doesn't really make sense to compare the cost estimation between different systems, uh, just because different systems would actually use um, different units, uh, different assumptions, right, different uh, definitions of this cost model, and just vary a lot uh, from system to system. So it just doesn't really make much sense if you compare uh, this cost estimation among different systems. And then another thing with this cost model is that 
this cost model is actually uh, independent of the uh, alternative query plan enumeration step or search step that we're going to talk about next, next class. So what this means is that for in one single system, uh, there could be uh, different alternatives of cost models, right? There could be a simple cost model, right? It's very easy to apply and very efficient to compute. And then there could be also be uh, complicated cost models, right? Would be maybe more accurate, but then maybe it's, it, 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 ha it takes more overhead uh, to invoke, right? And then different cost model may have different trade-offs, but then these are all independent of the uh, search mechanism, right? For, for these uh, cost models, you can just pretty much uh, plop down any of the cost models you have uh, to the search mechanism, and then it just the search mechanism just invoke the cost model as a black box, uh, typically. And then there are different choices uh, of this uh, cost model, right? People have used, uh, I mean, different ways with different units uh, to do this cost estimation. So here at a high level, we group them into uh, three uh, different categories. The first is called the physical cost, right? That would actually uh, include the uh, physical resource consumption that the system is going to take to execute that query, right? For example, it could be uh, CPU cycles, how many IOs you're going to perform, or even more fine-grained things like how many cache misses, uh, how, much pref how many prefetchings you're going to uh, perform, et cetera. So, and as you can probably realize, that it would depend a lot on the hardware, right? Depending on, on the speed of the hardware, on the CPU, uh, how big the cache the CPU has, or how fast uh, your disk is to perform sequential versus random I.O., et cetera. <laughs> so as a result, uh, this kind of uh, physical cost estimation would typically only be seen in a commercial or enterprise database system. Uh, so uh, I know MySQL, uh, not MySQL, SQL Server can do that. Oracle might be able to do that, I forgot. But for most of the uh, open source database system like Postgres or MySQL, uh, you are not going to see uh, this kind of uh, physical cost organization because it's, it's much more involved related to hardware. Uh, that said, it's only, uh, well, there's only one thing that um, most uh, open source uh, database system would consider in terms of this physical cost, which would be uh, the uh, cost that you distinguish between random uh, versus sequential I.O., right? So uh, because uh, for disk-based system, uh, that uh, matters a lot, and then a random and a sequential I.O. would have a very uh, distinct overhead, obviously. So uh, open source system would typically distinguish uh, between that, but for, for more fine-grained things, uh, typically you can only see them uh, in commercial systems. And then, the second type of uh, cost uh, that the systems can define would be called the logical cost, right? So uh, this, I mean, essentially, uh, like its name, in this step, you only consider the uh, logical intermediate computation uh, that you would need uh, in a query plan. So what does this mean? That just means that, oh, a little bit similar to our definition of uh, additional algebra equivalence. So by logical cost, it's just only going to look at uh, the size of the input and output of each operator during, you, during when you execute that query, right? So you first have a sequential scan that is going to uh, look at all the tuples. Well, then logical cost would just be the size of the, sorry, the table, right? Then after the, uh, the filter, then maybe you filter out, I mean, 90% of the queries, then the logical cost after the filter of what you are going to feed into the next operator would just be, I mean, the 10% of the number of tuples uh, before you filter it, right? So this to me, just the result size uh, between the operators, uh, the input and output. And lastly, uh, there's a third type of cost called uh, algorithmic cost. Uh, the, again, this is a little bit uh, straightforward as uh, what the name sounds like, right? So be beyond the uh, size of the input and output, let's say one operator would be um, hash join, right? So besides the input size of that hash join could be 1,000 tuple, output size could be, I don't know, 100. Uh, then this algorithmic cost would just uh, plop in the complexity of the uh, hash join operation uh, with the uh, number of input tuples, right? Which is n, this in this case would be 1,000. See, the complexity of hash join is also O n, it's just, uh, I mean, the cost is just 1,000 itself. But of course, for some other operations, the complexity is going to be uh, higher than O n, right? So uh, these are uh, the logical cost and the algorithmic cost are um, what mostly uh, used in uh, open source systems. Okay. So now uh, to emphasize a little bit more about uh, the cost in disk-based system, uh, since that's the system that we are going to uh, primarily uh, focusing on uh, in this lecture or in this course, right? Uh, 
Uh, so uh, for most of the disk-based systems, I mean, including MySQL, Postgres, etc., uh, the number of uh, disk accesses will just uh, usually dominate or always dominate uh, the execution time of a query, right? Because just comparing to the time you're going to uh, go to the disk and then fetch the result, or some, in some cases you're going to write the result back, and that the cost of the uh, CPU will just be uh, negligible, right? So um, for disk-based system, the cost model will just primarily be uh, considering the cost of the number of disk accesses. And like I mentioned earlier, in this case, obviously you just have to distinguish between a sequential and random I.O. Otherwise, your cost would be uh, off by a lot. Uh, and then another uh, thing uh, or nice thing about the database system is that since we are going to cost the disk access, uh, we need to know how the system is going to access the disk, right? Uh, but, uh, oh, not but, but uh, the lucky thing is that in a database system, we actually control, have control over our access on the disk, right? Instead of using the virtual memory and the page cache from the operating system, we actually have our own buffer pool, right? We know what the replacement policy is. We know what page will be, or what policy we are going to pin page and unpin page, etc., so that we can have a better uh, understanding of the uh, disk access of the system and better estimation of how many pages we need to uh, read or write, uh, right? So because we have control our, of our own uh, buffer pool manager. Oh, actually, another thing I forgot to mention is that, uh, again, for most of the systems, uh, we are going to, uh, when we uh, develop the cost model, we're actually only going to focus in on a query that is executed alone, right? So in most cases, uh, we are not going to consider the uh, contention uh, if you have a multiple queries uh, executed uh, concurrently, right? Say maybe there's some log contention, or maybe you are comp competing a disk uh, and I/O, etc. Right? So uh, this is not because this is a more accurate way. Or obviously, it's, it's more inaccurate, uh, but it's just a, a simplification or assumption that we make so that uh, we can make our uh, cost model simpler, right? And make our search process a little bit uh, easier and more efficient. Uh, and uh, for most of the uh, system, it only considers a single query, but I would say, uh, as, some, as I will show uh, one example, in some commercial system, it will also consider uh, certain aspects of the concurrent query. Not all, not all the aspects, but some commercial system will consider a few aspects of the concurrent queries well, that can make the estimation more accurate. But of course, it would be uh, much, more, much, much more complex. So let me just give you uh, two examples before we uh, wrap up. The one example would be an open source system, and then next I will be give you an example of the uh, commercial system. Right? So the open source system we'll be using is uh, Postgres. So uh, it, it is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, for, for open source system, the uh, cost model would be uh, simpler, right? It's not as uh, complicated and, and evolved as commercial system, but I still consider the cost model in Postgres system uh, is very good, and it's actually a kind of like a textbook uh, cost model uh, for the database system. So uh, essentially what it does is that it will just uh, use, uh, well, it will just use certain magical numbers to uh, distinguish between the cost of a sequential operation uh, versus uh, random uh, operation, as well as uh, operations in disk and, uh, and memory. So, so uh, like I specified or, or listed here, uh, the Postgres cost model, first of all, assumes that the system does not have uh, a large amount of memory, right? So that uh, most of the operations would be uh, performed onto the disk. But then, of course, there's a buffer pool, right? So there's, I mean, for some operations, could still be in memory, but that depends on the size of the buffer pool and your hit ratio, et cetera. But then, essentially, to distinguish between uh, memory versus disk, I mean, and also sequential versus random, the, the Postgres would just use uh, these random numbers. So to process a tuple in memory, Postgres would just uh, specify uh, that processing would be uh, 400 times faster than uh, reading a tuple from disk. Right? That's just a magic number. Right? There's no uh, specific reason why, but it's just uh, uh, determined uh, by the Postgres developers based on their experience right? to deal with the uh, data sets and Postgres query organization. And similarly, uh, in the uh, sequential versus uh, random I.O., there's just another random number that determines, uh, that decides that the sequential I.O. is going to be uh, four times faster uh, than random I.O. Right? So, so essentially, if you uh, specify the cost of a random, or, or for example, a sequential I.O. as one, uh, then uh, the cost of uh, random I.O. would just be uh, four, 
right? That is essentially how we distinguish between uh, those things. And then you times that magical number with the logical uh, cost model I discussed earlier, which would be the input output size, and then you times that again with the complexity of the operator, the complexity of the operator, right? So that's the equation is essentially your cost optimization. Does that make sense? Okay. So now, just to look a little bit specifically as, uh, at the Postgres documentation to see how uh, they uh, explain uh, these values or these magical numbers. So I mean, you can read it, but essentially uh, what they are saying is that uh, there's no a good way that they could find to determine those uh, magic numbers, right? So they just, uh, the writers just uh, uh, determines those numbers by themselves uh, at, with the values that they, they seem appropriate. And uh, I mean, across variant to variants, uh, these values are actually are generally pretty stable. I, I, I don't see they change these values like 400 or 4 drastically across different variants. Probably better for to make uh, the uh, Postgres system performance to be uh, more stable, right? Probably uh, better for that. But then uh, over time, they may also tweak it, right? Uh, gradually, especially if there's some like a very new hardware uh, that is released, right? Significantly change the properties of this random sequential I/O as well as memory access. Etc. Then they may go and uh, tweak these numbers, but but generally these numbers are stable. Okay. So uh, lastly, just to give you another example of the uh, IBM uh, DB2 cost model. Uh, so for this, I mean, I I I, well, I I don't have a source code access, so I don't don't know the exact formula anyway. But then I would think I could mention from a, a talk. Uh, I, the thing we could know from a talk by a uh, inside engineer from IBM is that uh, this, this IBM cost model consider ma many more aspects uh, compared to Postgres, right? For example, it will uh, first, of course, consider the uh, the properties of the database system or the, these columns themselves. For example, what would be uh, the schema? Would be the properties on the schema? Whether the schema is null or not null? Whether the schema has constraints? And it's also used uh, various statistics of uh, each column uh, in your database, right? Like uh, number of rows, uh, the distribution of the data, etc. It will also consider the hardware environment, right? It that will actually, when the system starts, it will actually run some macro benchmarks, right? To decide the, the property of the hardware to see uh, how fast the CPU is, how fast a random IO is, and how fast a sequential IO is, right? And then it will test the system and then determine uh, their number or their unit assigned to each operation uh, based on the micro benchmarks they run. And then for uh, the communication across the network, they also consider the network bandwidth, uh, et cetera, a network latency. And lastly, they actually also uh, consider the concurrent uh, operations of the queries, even though it's not everything, but then at least you will consider, hey, how many uh, concurrent users I have and what is the isolation level I'm using. Then under this isolation level, uh, with this many users, would it be possible that uh, I have lots of lock con lock contention on the data? And then maybe that will significantly slow the queries down, and then I need to do, uh, maybe I need to do certain optimizations on, on top of that. But all, all of these uh, would be uh, much more complex than the uh, Postgres optimizer, uh, that, that oh, sorry, Postgres talk, cost model that we talk about. All right, just uh, to wrap uh, today's uh, lectures up, essentially uh, we talk about, uh, we, we primarily talk about the statics rules, st static rules and the heuristics that we can use to optimize a query plan without even to look at what's the content of the data, right? What's the data distribution, what's the size uh, or the number of rows, et cetera. Uh, these are usually, typically uh, these uh, rules are efficient to apply. And then we also give a little bit of heads up on the cost model that we are going to use so that we can perform more uh, complicated or advanced enumeration of a different uh, alternative equivalent uh, original algebra uh, query plans uh, that we can, we can, and we can use these cost models uh, to compare the cost of these uh, alternatives and then determine uh, the, uh, well, to find out uh, the better query plan with more advanced optimizations. Right. So next next week, which, oh, sorry, next class, which is going to go a little, little bit deeper into the uh, statistics that we are going to use in the cost model, as well as uh, the uh, plan enumeration mechanism that we are trying to trying to find the better alternatives. All right, that's all of it. Have any questions? Uh, you can ask. Otherwise, we're well done. Look forward to see you next class. Hey!
Talking about the St. Ives brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent, plus it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. for a mic check, bust it. The fees are set to grab a 40. To put him the yoga, snap his neck. St. Ives. Take a sip and wipe your lips. You, my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the double. 